You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is Episode 60, covering the week of February 20th through February 24th, 2017. Glad to be back on the program with you. Now, before we get started with the material that we have for the week, please remember that we exist on your generous contributions alone. If you like this podcast, if you'd like the website, if you'd like to have more of our programs, we'd ask that you make a generous contribution to the Abbeville Institute. You can do so in two ways. Now, you can either donate at an annual rate, or you can donate monthly. Uh, if you want to donate monthly, we now have that option on our website. So you can go to abbevilleinstitute.org and go to support. Under that tab, click on Memberships for Individuals, and you can do from $3 a month if you're a student up to uh, $50 a month if you would like to. Or you can donate an annual rate. If you are a student and you have an EDU email address, you can donate at the $25 annual rate for students. And uh, so please think about doing that. Also, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube. If you do like this podcast and you like our material, please go out there and share that material on social media. If you are uh, interested in getting our Daily Dose of Dixie, which is our new daily email, uh, and also our weekly email, the Week in Review, through the email section, then you can go and provide an email address. You have to give us a little other information, too. But you can give us an email address, and uh, you can get a free ebook out of that. If you go to the website to do it, if you sign up through Facebook, um, that, that option is not available. But if you go to the website and sign up to our email list, uh, you can get uh, Emancipation Hell by Kirkpatrick Sale. We're working on another project that would replace that So um, in the future. Uh, but for right now, that's the book you get. But either way, you get the Daily Dose of Dixie, and you get our weekly uh, email as well. So uh, go on out there and get those things. And again, if you do like this stuff, it does take money to do all of these things. So we would really love your support. Okay, uh, that said, let's talk about the week. Uh, so February 20 through 24th, of course, this particular week started with, quote-unquote, President's Day. So we've got our glorification of the American executive beginning on Monday. And what better topic than to talk about presidents, right? So last week, we did a little bit with Lincoln, and actually our focus was supposed to be entirely on Lincoln last week, but that didn't happen. We had some other interesting stuff, some other things going on in the news, so we we addressed those issues. But this week, we did focus on the presidency for three of the articles, and then two of the articles actually focused on a really forgotten part of Southern history, and that is the Southern experience in the colonial period leading into the American War for Independence. And so um, I'll address that a little bit, but we have to remember a couple of things about the South and about Southern history. Most people think that Southern history is 1861 to 1865. And if you're not speaking of that period, well, then there's nothing else in the South. But what you have to remember about the South is that well, the Southern history is 400 years. It's 1607 in Jamestown to the present. So it's actually over 400 years now. And um, the South really dominated American history. You know, if you look at a presidential history, since we're going to do that this week, most of your presidents in the uh, early founding period, the antebellum period, were Southern. So you've got four out of the first five were from Virginia. Then moving forward, you've got Andrew Jackson, a Southerner. You've got uh, you know James K. Polk, a Southerner. William Henry Harrison was actually born in Virginia. John Tyler, a Southerner. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, Zachary Taylor, a Southerner. Uh, so you have these Southern presidents, and a lot of people forget that, that the South really did dominate American history in that first 80 years. You could even say that, uh, you know, Lincoln was a Southerner, at least by birth. He was born in Kentucky. Uh, so, of course, his family immigrated from New England, but, uh, you know, he was born in Kentucky. Uh, so, I mean, you, you have to understand that. Of course, the most important Supreme Court justice in this period of time John Marshall was a Southerner. Even Roger Tawney from Maryland, a Southerner. So uh, beyond that. So, I mean, the South dominated all three branches of the federal government. It dominated uh, American history. We wouldn't win the American War for Independence without the South. We wouldn't win the American War for Independence without George Washington. And George Washington being a Southerner and his character really determined what kind of America we were going to have. And we often talk about uh, Thomas Jefferson, the Jeffersonian political tradition on this program, but more than that, the Southern cultural tradition was an important component of what made America, America. 
and uh, we forget that at our own peril. So that said, it's, it's important for us to talk about the entirety of Southern history, not just the four-year period of the war. And I think that we, we often focus on that. You know, Some of the best-read pieces we have, of course, are on the war. Uh, just one of our pieces from last week on Robert E. Lee. Uh, that piece uh, was uh, widely circulated online. Uh, and so a lot of people like to talk about Lee and the war, but they should also like to talk about the American founding period, which focused a lot on the South. Uh, even 20th century Southern history is very important outside of the civil rights era. So, I mean, you look at early 20th century history, it would not be the same without the South, uh, the progressive era, and Southern resistance to that. So there's a lot of stuff to talk about uh, with Southerners. It's just we, we uh, look at that four-year period as kind of this definitive period in Southern history, and in so many ways it was. Uh, it was a watershed for Southern history, but uh, there's a lot of other things to talk about. So... Um, Let's talk about the pieces we had for the week. So we started off with a piece on, uh, on Monday entitled Finding the Swamp Fox, and it was written by Jeff Rogers. Uh, Jeff Rogers is a professor at history at uh, Gordon State uh, College. And um, it's a great piece. It's a book review of John Aller's The Swamp Fox, How Francis Marion Saved the American Revolution. And uh, this is a pretty popular book right now. Um, I think last time I checked on Amazon... Uh, it's doing fairly well. Uh, it's gotten a lot of five-star reviews. It's uh, uh, 34 reviews. It's sitting at uh, almost all five-star reviews. So it's a good book. Uh, Aller is not a professional historian. He's a, he's a lawyer and a journalist. He's actually from uh, New York City. And he wanted to write this book on Francis Marion. Now, as uh, Dr. Rogers points out at the beginning of this piece, not many people knew anything about the South and the American Revolution until recently. Uh, that's been a relatively recent phenomenon, really since the 1990s movie The Patriot, uh, or actually it's 2000 when that film came out, uh, filmed in 1990, late 1999, but then came out in 2000. That changed the way people thought about the Southern theater of war and the American War for Independence. But before that point, if you talked about the American War for Independence and you weren't talking about uh, you know, Boston or Saratoga or Valley Forge or Long Island, then you... I mean, people didn't think you knew anything about the American War for Independence, regardless of the fact that Washington is from Virginia. But everyone thought that the American War for Independence was Massachusetts. It was New York. It was Pennsylvania. But what people have figured out, and there's been a number of books that uh, focus on this particular aspect of it you know, um, uh, recently, is that the Southern theater was actually the most important theater in the war. Without the South, the United States does not gain their independence. They... Uh, they would be part and still subject to the British Empire after the war. So the South becomes the most important theater. And I, I mentioned that some historians have come around to this. A, a historian named John Furling, uh, who wrote a book entitled Almost a Miracle, gets into this idea of how important the South was. And this book came out not long ago. Uh, I want to say it was, let's see, it was somewhere, uh, it was 2007 that came out. So John Furling's Almost a Miracle is not bad. Uh, and it gets into the uh, to the struggle for independence uh, in George Washington. That, that phrase actually comes from George Washington. So uh, it's worth your time to read it if you like uh, this particular period and, of course, military history. And that's what John Aller's doing very well at this book, too, and uh, Dr. Rogers points that out. But most people didn't know about the South, uh, and uh, he actually brings up a, a, uh, <laughs> a quote from a New York author named John Buchanan, um, and... He wrote a book uh, entitled The Road to Gulliford Courthouse, The American Revolution in the Carolinas. It came out in 1997. And he says that, uh, you know, Buchanan was talking to one of his friends, who was very well educated, said he, he didn't really know what happened out, uh, south of Philadelphia at one point. I mean, nobody knew this stuff. So the Patriot comes out in 2000, and, of course, Mel Gibson turns the attention into the south, and we start talking about people like Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter and... Uh, uh, Andrew Pickens and John Rutledge and Daniel Morgan. We start looking at these people in the South who are doing much to bring about uh, victory in the American War for Independence, but they're often ignored. Uh, and so I think it's important to uh, to discuss, you know, where the South fits into this. You know, so when the war was was going was ongoing, uh, th when you had the Battle of Saratoga, that was part of a concerted effort to try to isolate Washington in the North. And so when uh, Saratoga was a major victory for the American uh, Continental Army. 
the British turned their attention to the south. And, of course, they had already occupied Charleston and Savannah. And it took a concerted effort, basically from the saddle, from John Rutledge, the governor of South Carolina, to root out the British in South Carolina. And so you had people like Sumter and, and Marion and Pickens doing uh, a tremendous job in guerrilla warfare in the south, getting these, dislodging the British from South Carolina and also North Carolina. You had the, uh, you know, the Battle of, uh, of Kings Mountain and uh, you know, so you had these these uh, very important battles, the Battle of Calpens in South Carolina, very important battles that dislodged the British from the south and forced them to move into Virginia, where, of course, you get the Battle of Yorktown. So without the south, you don't have uh, this particular, uh, you know, this, this victory in 1781. You, you just don't have it. Uh, without the south and the southern theater, Washington might have been trapped again and surrounded if, if, it, if it goes better for the British in the South than it did. And so uh, we forget that. We forget how important the South was to the early Federal Republic to forming uh, this central government for the United States. Uh, and, of course, these states, and, you know, one thing that's important that I pointed out when I've written about Marion and others, Thomas Sumter, is that these guys really didn't think they were fighting for a national government. They weren't nationalists. They were fighting for South Carolina. Um, and that's an important distinction to make. You know, one thing the war did do for some people like John Marshall and Alexander Hamilton is it created kind of a national identity. But for many people fighting in that war, particularly in the South, it was all about defending their home against the British, and their home, their country was Virginia or North Carolina or South Carolina or Georgia uh, or Maryland. That was, that was what they were defending. They weren't fighting for some lofty um, you know, proposition that all men are created equal or that they're fighting for, uh, you know, a, a national government in Philadelphia. They're fighting for their home and for their families. And if the British would just leave, they would stop fighting. So they were fighting for the rights of Englishmen. And you can't say they were fighting for those principles, those principles which had been carved out in 1215 by the Magna Charta and the, and the, uh, and the Battle of Runnymede. Uh, and then, of course, moving forward to the English Bill of Rights of 1688, they were fighting for those things, but not some proposition that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator of certain inalienable rights. I mean, these are things that we often think, well, this is what they're fighting for, these American principles. Um, so I think it's important to make that distinction. We, we forget that. We forget how important just the South was for this war and how that provincialism was also important. I mean, when you get to 1861, Southerners start talking about the American War for Independence as the, the war in 1861 was a continuation on this tradition. So did the North. I mean, they, they mentioned this too. I don't, to me, this, it's a little stretch for them uh, because and they're, what they were doing is fighting as the British were. Uh, but for the Southerners, and they're fighting for their independence. Uh, and you can't get around that. So uh, the, the war was still on their mind, and they did think that they were fighting for, you know, for the heroes of the South of, of the 1770s. Uh, and they looked at it in that way. And I think a nice you know, corollary to that is the piece that we published on Friday by Dave Benner, uh, Southern Nullification of the Stamp Act. And he brings up, you know, most people focus on the North and the Stamp Act, uh, but there was a lot of Southern resistance to the Stamp Act as well. And in fact, uh, they were nullifying uh, the Stamp Act. And I think um, the best book on this is Edmund Morgan's uh, The Stamp Act Crisis, uh, which was published initially in the 1950s. And then it's been republished several times, uh, most recently, I think, in the 1990s. But uh, if you want to read a nice book about the Stamp Act, and it, it, there's actually a chapter in that book entitled Nullification. And I think Morgan would have known something about that. Uh, he was a great historian. Um, and he says, look, what's happening in 1765 is nullification. The colonials, whether it's in the north or the south, they're nullifying this Stamp Act. Um, and we forget that. I mean, you have these idiots that run around out there today, and I'm not going to name them. You can go out there and find them online. Uh, of course, it's the crowd, the uh, uses the pejoratives, you know, neo-Confederates and uh, this kind of thing, these morons that say this stuff. So you have these morons running around out there, and they seem to believe, I, I just don't know how, but they seem to believe that anything that has to do with secession, nullification, decentralization, these type of ideas, all of this, was somehow, somehow, the product 
of slavery. And not just that. All of this was created by a bunch of horned, uh, you know, fork-tailed Southerners in 1861. Before that, no one ever talked about nullification or slavery. No one. No one. Or I should say nullification and secession. No one talked about that. Before that, it was just this. It came up out of thin air in 1861. So nullification and secession, thin air, 1861. And, uh, you know, this is nowhere American. American is fighting for the Union and, uh, you know, centralization and uh, top-down government. That's American. But what you find is that as early as 1765, the American tradition was nullification, local self-government, decentralization. In fact, the entire American War for Independence was a constitutional crisis, so to speak. It was a a dispute about the powers of the central authority in Parliament and those that were that were held in the colonies. And so the colonial leaders believed that the Parliament could regulate trade. They conceded that, and they could defend the colonies, but they could not interfere with their internal business. Even the radical Thomas Paine said this. If they can legislate for us in all cases whatsoever, this is a phrase that was used, then... They can do anything they want. Now, how is that any different than what Southerners were saying in 1860 and 61? It's no different. It's the American tradition. And so we somehow have created this very stupid, distorted view of American history that we've always believed in rah-rah central government, that the central government is always right, the central government does no wrong, that everything it does is constitutional because it says it is. And if you resist that, well, you're just, you're just a nullifier. You're just a secessionist. You're a right-wing idiot radical. What we find is that left-wingers like nullification and secession, too, and New Englanders were the first ones to push secession uh, in the early uh, 19th century and late 18th century. The first time we, uh, we can find any evidence of anyone talking about secession after the Constitution was ratified was in 1794 when Oliver Ellsworth and Rufus King pulled aside John Taylor of Caroline and said, hey, look, John, this isn't working for us anymore. How about Virginia lets us go? We want New England to secede. That's the first time. We're talking about five years after the Constitution had been ratified and the government had been put into uh, place. Five years. We'd had the election of George Washington in 1788. First Congress didn't convene until 1789. Washington didn't assume office until 1789. So we're talking five years. Five years. New England already wanted out. And then, of course, they talked about it over and over again. 1800, 1803, 1815. Abolitionists were talking about in 1848. You still had abolitionists pushing secession even during the war and saying, why are we even upset that the South is going? This is what we wanted. Get the slaveholders out of the Union, and now we've got our own Union. Free from the South. There you go. So uh, this is, again, it's these idiots that run around and they, I'll I'll be kind about, I could use some pretty colorful language about them, but uh, idiot is the best thing I think I can say in a PG environment or a very G-rated environment, I should say, which I try to keep this podcast to that. So we have, we actually have uh, young people listen to this podcast and that's great. Uh, So Uh, It's important to understand American history and this idea of what real federalism meant and what uh, real secession and decentralization and nullification, what this meant. And so Dave Benner's piece does a very nice job in portraying the South was involved in this nullification movement in 1765, but, you know, so were Northerners. One thing you can say about uh, the the legal structure in Virginia during the colonial period, which I think is interesting, is that when the uh, state, or at this time colonial government, passed a law. So you had, in Richmond, um, eventually you had the uh, House of Burgesses pass a law. Uh, The colonial courts could decide if they were going to enforce that law or not. Essentially what they were doing is nullifying it. So even in in the colony of Virginia, or then later the state of Virginia, you had a kind of a decentralized structure because the Lord, the, the rule of the manor, 
you know, in this case. It used to be the lord of the manor who made it, but the, the rule of the manor, meaning the local community, the town, they could just say, look, we're not enforcing that law here. Sorry. I mean, we're going to enforce our own law. Uh, and your law is unconstitutional. was not doing it. Sheriffs could do that, elected sheriffs. So you had this very local resistance to central authority when it was unconstitutional or illegal. I mean, this is the American tradition. The American tradition. And, of course, the South held on to this longer than did the North. Uh, now, the North is rediscovering decentralization right now, but um, I'm not sure they're too committed to the idea other than they just don't like the current political situation. So those are two very good pieces. And then, of course, we had three pieces dedicated to the American presidency. The first by um, Jocelyn Dunlop, who is a former, uh, a former um, uh, journalist, and she's good friends with, uh, with Clyde Wilson. And uh, she sent this uh, particular piece, or actually he sent it to me from her. Uh, and it's about Trump. And she wrote a letter talking about how she explains Trump's to Trump, the ph- Trump phenomenon to the Brits. Uh, she has friends from Great Britain. They say, you know, what's going on with, with, with y'all over there? I mean, what, what's happening here in, in the United States? You know, they had their own situation with Brexit. And again, these morons that, uh, you know, well, Brexit's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. You can't have self-determination. The Brits can't be out on their own. I remember one time there was a, when, when there was a real question about the secession of Quebec from Canada back in the 90s. Uh, one of the uh, leaders of Canada said, well, what do these Quebecers think they're doing? They have the goal. They believe they can govern themselves. Oh, my gosh. Poli- people actually believe they can govern themselves. I mean, what a novel idea. Uh, but, yeah, so Britain did that. So she gets into the idea. You know, the, the real issue here uh, with Trump is that people feel betrayed by both parties, the Democrat Party, uh, the Republican Party. And so Trump has just come out with this agenda uh, where he basically says, look, we're going we're gonna to put America first. Uh, that becomes a very popular message. And, you know, we're going to stop. We're going to focus on us. Now, this actually, if you think about Trump, Trump is nothing more in so many ways than maybe a mid-20th century Democrat. That's what he is. Uh, and uh, he, he's, he's, he's not a modern establishment Republican. And so the modern establishment Republicans couldn't stand it. And she talks about how th- there was an attempt to stop the professionals, the establishment class, all these other people were looking to stop him. Uh, and so we had the Trump phenomenon. People feel betrayed. And that actually comes down to what we're doing here at the Institute. The reason people feel betrayed is because they put all their faith in the center. We've talked about this over and over again. Uh, you know, if you want the central government to do everything for you, you're going to be disappointed quite a bit because 50% of the people are controlling the other 50% of the people. And why is that fair and just? Why is it fair? that 50% of the population can control the other 50%. If you had a decentralized situation like we had, and we just talked about the American War for Independence and how important that was, if you had that situation where people governed themselves and their own local governments, well, then you wouldn't even worry about the central authority. You wouldn't even worry about the presidency at all, other than what's the president going to do in foreign policy, which is very, very important. So one of the things that people liked about Trump, uh, at least on the campaign trail, was his non-interventionist foreign policy positions. We forget how important that is for the president to set the agenda for foreign policy and how important it is really to have a non-interventionist foreign policy. There's actually a really great book that just came out, and we were going to talk about it here, and I probably will at some point, but it's by Stephen Kinzer. Now, Stephen Kinzer is – he's – a left, <coughs> excuse me, a left-leaning journalist, but he wrote a book entitled "The True Flag: Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of the American Empire," and he gets into the Spanish-American War, and then the subsequent engagements after that, the Filipino-American War, and uh, how Mark Twain, you know, this non-inter, it's non-imperialist league, how Mark Twain, Mark Twain is unfoils, but he was against American imperialism, and so were a lot of other people. It's a very uneasy coalition of people or people that you wouldn't think we'd get along like Andrew Carnegie and Samuel Gompers on the same side on the issue of, uh, of imperialism and how they were opposed to it. They were against it. 
Southerners were against imperialism. He gets into that a little bit. Uh, so it's interesting how uh, you had uh, this you've had this departure from what the president's really supposed to do because he has to be focused on bathroom laws. I mean, come on. Uh, that's a state issue. It always has been. A lot of the things we focus, you know, education, uh, marriage, all these things are state issues. And that's what they should be. That's, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that allows the general government to do these things. So, uh, you know, when you look at the Southern political tradition of decentralization, real federalism, I mean, this is, uh, this was a key component of Jefferson's political philosophy. It didn't matter what issue you're talking about. It was uh, you know, decentralization federalism. He believed the states and the local communities should have the most control over the issues that affect them the most. And if we just had that position, we would be so much better off in America. You wouldn't have all these angry people running around all the time. Because you could have your the type of government you want in your state, and you can move somewhere else. If you don't like that state, go move somewhere else. Go live in that government. So the important thing about this piece on Trump is that people have felt betrayed. And Trump was able to capitalize on that because he spoke in an anti-establishment manner. Now, the piece that I wrote on Wednesday, Washington versus Lincoln, kind of got into this, but it was more about character. You know, there was a C-SPAN just released a poll of establishment historians where, of course, Lincoln's number one and Washington's number two. And so we always think Lincoln and Washington. I mean, they're just one and two, same guy. But they were miles apart in who they were as men. They've got their two monuments there. you got one, uh, the Washington Monument, and then standing across the, the Washington Mall in the reflecting pool, you've got the Lincoln Memorial. And so people put them together all the time. But one spot in the – I mean, look, first of all, Lincoln should be near the bottom of the list. I wouldn't say he's the worst, but he's in the bottom three. Uh, and then Washington really does deserve to be at the top of the list. But just in terms of character and the things that you got into here, uh, they're rearing. You know, Washington is reared as a gentleman. Lincoln was born to a shiftless farmer who couldn't really keep his land. He grew up around rough men and rough, rough women uh, on the frontier. You know, Washington was a frontiersman too, but he had refinement. Uh you know, Lincoln was supposedly this physical specimen, a big guy, you know, broad guy who could wrestle and uh, split logs. But he didn't even know how to defend himself. You know, Albert Taylor Bledsoe had to teach him how to use a broadsword for a duel. Lincoln was uh, part of the Black Hawk War, but he didn't see any combat. On the other hand, Washington hunted. He was a soldier. He saved uh, the British at the Battle of Monongahela in 1755. Uh, he, or otherwise known as the Battle of the Wilderness sometimes, where Edward Braddock was uh, uh, defeated. Uh, without him, we don't win the American War for Independence. He was called out of retirement in 1798 to lead Americans against the French in a war that never materialized. So Washington was a, was a man of action. He was, a, he was an action hero of the 18th century, the best athlete. Washington avoided public life. Lincoln sought it. Washington would have been somebody even if he had never been president. I mean, th I think that's the most important distinction to make. He would have been someone had he not been president. Lincoln would have been no one had he not been president. Nobody would even know about Abraham Lincoln had he never been president. Uh, Washington faced a crisis as president, several of them. One of the most famous being the Whiskey Rebellion. I think that his response was unconstitutional. He listened too much to Hamilton, but he was patient. He spent two years trying to exhaust every means to handle that situation outside of violence, Lincoln sent in the troops right away. Washington tolerated dissent. He thought the Union should tolerate differences between the North and the South, not Lincoln. Lincoln didn't tolerate any dissent. He had people thrown in jail, closed down elections. So the two men are entirely different, just in terms of the way they were described. Lincoln was described as a guerrilla, a first-rate, second-rate man, an ordinary Western man, a fool. He was weak, a man of inferior character. Washington was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen, the father of his country. Uh, Lincoln inherited a federal republic and created a myth of national supremacy. Washington never pretended to be anything but the president of a federal republic. So the chasm between the two is, is just tremendous. Lincoln shouldn't even be in the same conversation with George Washington, yet he is. And I think that shows you how bad the historical profession has gotten. 
And the piece on Thursday by Clyde Wilson, the American president from Cincinnati to Caesar, the quote at the end of the piece is, is tremendous because he says, uh, Clyde says at the end that, um, I can get it here for you, uh, all three branches of the federal government, and thus the people too, are guilty in the transformation of America from a constitutional federal union to an empire. But it was the president who was meant to check evil tendencies in the body politic. This is why he was given the power to negate acts of Congress and to appoint the judges and generals. He was to be the hero of Republican virtue, who would represent all the people as a historic community of freedom rather than a coalition of interest groups and ideological agendas. At the beginning of the new millennium, he wrote this in 2000, we can see only too well how misplaced was the hope. From Cincinnati to Caesar was a long road. From Caesar to Caligula's, but a few short and easy steps. And so he goes through the history of the American presidency. Uh, and it's a, it's a tremendous essay. Uh, it's a long essay, but he goes through the history of the American presidency, and he starts with Washington and what Washington was. And then we start moving forward in time, and he really sees the turning point for many people, for, in many ways, was Martin Van Buren when you started to see parties. Now, Van Buren as a president wasn't bad. In fact, I think he's one of the ten best in terms of his, his stance in upholding the Constitution, which is how I rate the president. But he was a disaster in creating political parties. Uh, so Van Buren, the president, you have to separate from Van Buren, the politician. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. Now, uh, when you start getting parties, and we see this all the time, if an R is in office, well, the Republicans are fine no matter what that R is doing. The Democrats are always against it, even though it might be in their own best interest to support it. When the D is in office, the situation is reversed. What we've got now is that everyone thinks the president should do everything. And that's where Clyde is saying from you know Caesar to Caligula. It's not that far. It took a long time to get from the, the, the Cincinnatus, which is George Washington, the man who put down his plow, went to work, and then went back to his farm. He didn't really want the job. And then we've gotten to Caesar the impressive dictator, essentially. But going from that to a tyrant, Caligula, it's not going to take long. And so this history of the American presidency is really interesting, and I think you should take the time to read this article. I don't want to go through it all because of time, but uh, it's well worth your time to go out and read Clyde Wilson as a historian, which, um, you know, a little story about Clyde. I'll never forget uh, when... Uh, I, uh, I first attended graduate school there at South Carolina, and a, a friend of mine, actually um, Jeff Rogers, who was, uh, wrote the, the first piece for the week, we went in and uh, he met with us, and he sat back in his chair, and his first question uh, at, on this day was, tell me what everything you know about George Washington. And Jeff and I kind of looked at each other, and we thought, you know, what does he mean? What does he want to know? And so Clyde just started rattling stuff off about George Washington. He said, if you're going to have a Ph.D., you got to know this stuff. Uh, he said, what about Thomas Jefferson? Did the same thing. So he started, he said, look, you all have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so his thing was, know the people, know the sources, get down in the sources. He wasn't as considered, uh, as, uh, as worried about the secondary literature, though you needed to know that. But his idea, and it was Forrest McDonald's idea too, is get in the sources. Forrest McDonald never read much of the secondary literature. He read the primary sources, which was the important thing to do. So this is where uh, reading the primary material is so important uh, when, you, when you're a historian uh, because that is the meat and potatoes of what it takes to be a real good historian. And so the more you can do that, the more you can get out and read the letters and the speeches and the newspaper articles and these type of things and really get into the heart of what these people were doing and thinking and the things they were saying, the better off you're going to be as a historian. So I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this particular podcast on the presidency and uh, southern uh, – history in terms of the American War for Independence. And until next time, good day. Mm -hmm.